All right, let's get started. I'm going to tell you that I'm not smart enough to get money out of anybody, so I've got no disclosures. Um, I just want to give you a little background. Mount Sinai Hospital started in 1852. Back then it was actually called the Jews Hospital because all the hospitals in New York were faith-based at that time. And Jewish patients had nowhere else to go and Jewish doctors had nowhere to practice. And so it moved in uh, 1904 to its current uh, main campus on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and the buildings are different, but the location is the same. Uh, it's a pretty big place now. There, uh, we recently took over an eighth hospital, so we're over 7,000 physicians. Uh, we have the largest uh, residency training program actually in the U.S. when you put together all of our hospitals, and over 6,000 nurses, and we just escaped, and luckily none of them, none of them decided to have a strike. Um, and so we have a huge workforce, and we're spread out more regionally. You know, the places like Cleveland Clinic or Mayo, they may have a, a hospital in a Florida or in Arizona, but in New York, um, it's a different situation. About a quarter of the U.S. population lives between the Boston area and the Washington area, and New York's right in the middle. So when you get about a, 150 kilometers or so outside of New York, you probably have about 50 million people that you're, you're dealing with. It overlaps, of course, uh, with Connecticut and Pennsylvania, and you have Philadelphia. So within this regional area, there's just really a, a huge patient population. And that's where our focus has been as we've evolved from a standalone academic medical center into a health system. And these are just some of the numbers. I really should turn the, the baby number down because we sent some of them to other hospitals in Brooklyn. So now we're uh, down around, uh, I, I, I think maybe we're only around 14,000 deliveries a year, but everything else is quite huge. If you're in Manhattan, there's a 40% chance if you're in a hospital bed that you're in a Mount Sinai Health System hospital bed. And why do I talk about the scale and the size? It's not for bragging, but to talk about the evolution in the U.S. healthcare system. This is bond ratings. This is economists rating hospitals. And if you look at this, which you can see, even though the data are back from 2013, this was the beginning of a huge trend in the U.S. where people moved from standalone academic centers or standalone hospitals, and they started aggregating into health systems because of economic necessity. Because the margin, we don't like to say profit in many cases, at least in New York, we have no for-profit hospitals. Our state is a no corporate practice of medicine state in the U.S., and so we have not-for-profit hospitals. So we don't talk about profit, we talk about margin. And so the margins have been getting narrower and narrower over the years for US healthcare. And one of the ways to survive in an environment where, the narrow, where you have narrow margins is to be of a larger scale. I run a, a committee called Corporate Value Analysis. So I get the lowest prices on paper and toner for the printers, but also on implants for hips or for suture material. And so we look over and over again at expensive and even inexpensive materials because with a health system of that size, we can use our size to be competitive and to negotiate and also to have efficiencies in our corporate level. So that is a very important thing to consider when you think about the economy and the, the, the background of the US health system because some of what we're talking about today will uh, evolve into in your business cases, if some of you are out there doing startups, thinking about what is the entry into the US healthcare system and how do I and people like me who have to run these healthcare systems think? All right, so what are the economic drivers of healthcare? Obviously, personnel are very expensive. So can, for example, would AI of the future reduce the need for expensive personnel, physicians, nurses, the extenders, we believe very strongly in the US about physicians being extended by having physician assistants and nurse practitioners. I know that's not as prevalent here. All of the support staff, everyone who cleans, everyone who delivers food, every single aspect of that. I need about six employees for every one hospital bed I have at Mount Sinai Hospital because of the needs of an acute care setting. Obviously, it's much less expensive to live, deliver care in the outpatient setting. And so the expensive resources are hospital care, especially critical care. And this year, uh, because the margins are often higher on high complexity work, we will actually open in 2019 42 additional critical care beds. I didn't build a new hospital because I'm stuck in a place where real estate's very expensive and so far the city of New York will not give me part of Central Park. 
So I'm stuck living in the, my, in, in the campus where I am, and I repurpose and I use uh, floors that might not have been intensive care units before or might have been used for offices, and I turn them into clinical space. Emergency departments, post-acute care, such as the skilled nursing facility, the long-term acute care hospital, the home care, post-acute is very expensive, and I'm going to come back to that. The supplies, the drugs, the remainder of our supply chain, and, of course, the capital costs of our aging infrastructure. Our, we've been on that campus since 1904, and some of our buildings that are used clinically are getting to be 60 or 70 years old. And it's not, actually one of them is over 100 years old. It's not easy to maintain and to refresh those buildings. And in New York, the cost of building is extremely high. And what do we do if we tear down a building? Where are we gonna put all the patients in the meantime? Not so easy. So think now about value metrics. Observe to expected mortality, complication rates better than benchmarks. How are we evaluated? Not just by ourselves, but by external agencies, by insurers, by payers, by the government. How are we going to be ranked in US News and World Report? These are all things that we have to be concerned about. And beyond those external measures, we think internally about it, the infectious complications, the length of stay, the readmissions, and we now have sometimes penalties we, may, uh, we talk about value-based care. Value-based care is two things. You might be paid better for higher complexity work. You may be paid better if you do a better job in terms of having uh, uh, better observed to expected metrics. But you also have penalties if you have a uh, length of stay that's too long in terms of a fixed DRG uh, or readmission penalties typically readmissions within 30 days. And so controlling our costs, the ICU and the hospital stay, the use of blood, meaning blood transfusion, laboratory testing, radiology, consultations, the post-acute care, it all comes together. So thinking about it just in the simplest way, think about what is that value equation. Since we don't have infinite dollars, which is the cost at the bottom of that equation and the denominator, the numerator of quality, safety, and satisfaction divided by cost is value. And so here we are thinking about the value equation. And we show this slide a lot in the US. I'm not sure 100% you know, about the truth of it. But supposedly, as of last year, about 90% of our payments were linked in some, in some fashion to value. But what does that really mean? Uh, also, 6% of our revenue from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services since 2017, 6% is at risk. And most hospitals, something around a quarter of their patients will be Medicare patients. And these penalties are significant. VBP is a value-based purchasing program. Uh, that would be things like observed to expected metrics or satisfaction. HRRP is the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program. Remember, those are the penalties for being readmitted within 30 days. That's very high in diagnoses like acute um, uh, uh, myocardial infarction or advanced heart failure. And finally, there's the Hospital Acquired Conditions Reduction Program. Think about things like uh, pressure ulcers. So, uh, and, uh, and honestly, I, I can't, uh, and I think uh, um, uh, infections also fit in that one as well. And this isn't just Medicare and Medicaid by extension. This is the commercial payers as well. As well. So our contracts with our commercial payers all include some form of value program, which could either be penalties or bonuses, depending upon the negotiation, depending upon the metric. So also you have to think about a patient is not a patient is not a patient. Patients are different. So if we look at major joint replacement, uh, and you look at the bottom of this slide, what you see is that the dark blue and the lighter blue is the expense related to the indexed hospitalization. And then when you get to the top, when you look at the red, and, the, uh, and it, there's not really much yellow in this one, and the grayish at the top, that's post-acute care. And so as we move into bundled pace, uh, base payment, or an ACO type model, we are accountable for the spend. And so, for example, uh, when our orthopedic surgeons choose to send their patient to a skilled nursing facility instead of to home with home physical therapy, the cost is higher. And if we're in a bundle, and those bundles are not always uh, uh, voluntary, they may be mandatory, we will lose money if we have surgeons who overuse the skilled nursing facility or the acute inpatient rehab. And in fact, there's a physician that I'm moving towards 
frankly, getting, uh, moving him away from our hospital. He will lose his job because he's a very stubborn guy and he refuses, despite being shown data over several years, to change his practice pattern. You know, because of our system, we don't immediately say, hey, you have one bad quarter, you're out the door. But the point is, the, the, the surgeons uh, become our partners in this. But if you look at cardiac valve surgery or coronary bypass surgery, about 90% of the cost is in the inpatient stay. So our problems are different depending upon different kinds of patients, which will influence the way we analyze our efforts and how we direct our efforts towards decreasing that cost. And then on top of that, thinking more in a population health context, we say, I'm not so sure about the number, that we spend uh, something around 80% of our healthcare dollars on about 20% of the population, which is the top of that pyramid, and maybe something like 50% of the healthcare dollars on the top 5%. So focusing on, and frankly identifying, who is in that pyramid at the top, and figuring out effective interventions for people who are at the top of that pyramid is one of our key challenges. So the people at the very top of the pyramid, they may be the poor people of East Harlem who live right next to Mount Sinai, that's our neighborhood. We're on the border between a very wealthy neighborhood, the Upper East Side, and a very poor neighborhood, East Harlem. And so many of the patients we care for uh, will be at much higher risk for readmissions and other problems because the social determinants of care are very important in their outcomes. And so the interventions will be different also depending upon not just the type of patient they are, whether it's a heart patient or a joint patient, but also their social background. So let me give an example of things that are very important in hospitals these days, decreasing sepsis mortality. There are a lot of different reasons why this became important, but uh, sometimes it, it relates back to a story. There was a, a boy uh, about, maybe it's about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit longer, who went to a hospital in New York and uh, went to an emergency room and they, uh, you know, he had some nonspecific symptoms. They sent him home and he came back later with overwhelming sepsis and he died. Very tragic story. And it frankly could have happened to any hospital in the U.S. because it just is the nature of that business that sometimes you miss a diagnosis. But within hospitals, the sepsis mortality rate was really quite high. And just looking at our history from before we started working on sepsis reduction starting in about 2011 to through 2014, we put a lot of effort into, as many hospitals have done in the U.S., identifying patients who are at high risk of sepsis, using very sensitive but non-specific sepsis indicators based upon physiologic signs, the blood pressure, the temperature, the respiratory rate, and looking at these over time and creating response teams that would come to the bedside and evaluate the patient were obviously, like other hospitals, easily able to reduce the sepsis mortality rate by about 50%. But then you end up with a plateau. You can't get below a certain number, and you wonder, how can we start to get better? So for example, could AI help us be more effective at that? And I'll come back to that. Also thinking about palliative care enhancement. In the US, there's an there, there is a necessity, thinking about to that pyramid that I talked about before, moving towards value-based care. And value-based care is not spending 50% of your healthcare dollars on 5% of your population. And how do we get there? Part of that is thinking about how to move palliative care upstream. So palliative care in hospice, right before I started as hospital president, here, uh, I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it circles there, it's, uh, no, it doesn't really show up on the screen, but here, 5% in 2012 at the bottom, the bottom row were the patients on our hospice floor uh, that were dying on the hospice benefit. And we're up now to something over 80, 90% because we put a lot of effort into it. I had to fight a little bit with the chief of, of hospice and palliative care because they said they need a physician and a nurse practitioner and a social worker, and every single one of those teams had to be one, 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 and I said that's too expensive a model, but don't worry, we're, it's New York, it's like Israel, we can have healthy discussions, and we can eventually move to different models, but one of my goals as a hospital leader is to move palliative care upstream by having enough resources and frankly engaging in discussions. We have uh, very orthodox Jewish patients as well at Mount Sinai, and so we work with a group. Uh, they say Chaim Aruchim. I was trained you know, to pronounce it Chaim Aruchim, but whether we call them, they work with us. 
And they don't want to call it hospice. They don't want to call it palliative care. But they will work with us to help people at the end of life. And they will move them sometimes towards uh, long-term acute care hospitals or skilled nursing facilities or even to home with a home ventilator, let's say, and try to understand. And they work with us and help us communicate with these very large and sometimes unruly families to try to get the communication going and move people out of the acute care setting. And so we can do better, and it isn't something where all cultures are barriers. Also, excess days reduction. So what is an excess day? Well, think of an excess day as an observed to expected length of stay. And if it's greater than one, which is not optimal, multiply that by the number of patients in that diagnosis, in our case, the DRG, the diagnosis-related group. And we spent a lot of effort between 2014 and 15 working on the problem of the third one down there, respiratory failure. Well, why was that a problem? Well, you know, we had these intensive care units, and I was creating an institute for critical care medicine, and depending upon which uh, uh, unit and who was running the unit, whether it was a surgical unit, a medical unit, we'd say, oh, you know, they haven't been, they haven't been off the ventilator for a week. Well, if they're not off in a few more days, maybe we'll think about a tracheostomy. Oh, well, maybe we'll now we'll make the consult for the tracheostomy. Oh, well, maybe it's Friday, maybe we'll do the tracheostomy Monday. Oh, maybe we should put in a PEG tube, a percutaneous enterogastrostomy tube. Oh, when should we get around to doing that? So we've gotten to a different pathway. And that was expensive, by the way, because we had to work on creating family meetings to indicate to the families that your family member is now chronically critically ill, identifying that faster, getting them on a faster pathway towards tracheostomy, PEG, transition towards a long-term acute care hospital, and remember people who survive sepsis are really sick. So as we were surviving sepsis, we were actually creating more excess days. So you solve one problem, cause another. But it involved a lot of work. These are all problems, by the way, which we look towards developing internally our own prediction algorithms. So I'm gonna jump over this one just in the interest of time. Another thing, it's sometimes low tech too. Part of it is being able to access big data and present it to people, maybe without any, not any fancy predictive algorithms, but presenting it to people in a useful fashion. Now, I know surgeons because I'm an anesthesiologist. I work with them every day. They all worked hard in school to get the best grades so they could get the best residency. And when you give them report cards, they tend to respond. And so these are report cards about observed to expected mortality, complications, and in addition to that, we also talk to them about things like blood utilization. So here in this particular uh, view, we're looking at the number of patients on the, right upper, uh, on the right side on the top, how many patients got transfused more than four units of blood. And so we give these data to every cardiac surgeon and they see it as a report card, and they know it gets reported to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, which is a national, international database, and they don't want to look bad. And so sometimes it's about creating the right kind of reports and communicating it effectively. Another example of something that was very simple, just showing people, because I'm an anesthesiologist and I'm annoying, just a classic nudge, as my mother would say, and how did I, uh, how did I get the, uh, the, the transfusion rates down by 25% at Mount Sinai Hospital? There was no magic here. We sent reports every day to every unit of every patient who was transfused with a starting hemoglobin greater than 7 or an ending hemoglobin greater than 9. Just very simple reporting, and again, just staying on top of it, and there was no predictive algorithm here. It was simple Hawthorne effect, showing people the results. And here's another example of building things into the workflow. This is just simple rules-based again. This is not AI, but once again, who is likely to have hyperkalemia in the hospital? Well, that we didn't predict, but when they did get hyperkalemia, what we started doing was we created a connection between the observation and action. We have in a system based upon joint commission what we call the throw catch pass, like American football. The laboratory sees a potassium greater than six. They throw it, they call the nurse on the floor and say, hello, this patient has a potassium of 6.2. And the nurse then has to catch the number and read back, oh yes, patient Marsha Jones has a potassium of 6.2. Then the nurse has to pass the ball to the intern 
uh, who um, uh, receives the number, potassium is 6.2, and then the intern falls asleep and doesn't do anything about it, and that's called the fumble. And so how do we get past throw, catch, pass, fumble? It's by being really annoying. Once again, it, mostly it's about me being very annoying as a human being. And how does that translate into creating systems? Well, we have middleware, which communicates between the epic electronic record and the voice over internet protocol badges that the nurse carry. And every half an hour, the nurse gets an alert. Potassium greater than six, no uh, effective action because we monitor for a hyperkalemia order set in the electronic record, and we monitor for a repeat laboratory number with a potassium less than six. And if you look at the graph at the bottom, even though the numbers are still too high and they're still coming down, we cut 45 minutes off the response time to hyperkalemia just by doing a better communication system. So it isn't only about prediction, it's about implementation. I would argue with you that it's uh, that somebody used to say, an old saying in English anyway, is that any, any good idea is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And this is the 99% perspiration, is how do you embed your algorithms into workflows? And frankly, to get people to accept it. Even though we have nursing unions, I make rounds very frequently in our hospital, there's not a single nurse who's ever told me that this isn't a, a terribly annoying system, but there's also not a single nurse who's ever told me to turn it off, okay? Because they know it. They know that it's good for patients. They know that it saves lives, and that's why we do it. So let's talk about clinical data science and how we've had to do it. Now, Matt Levin, who's giving a lecture in another hall, can probably explain this graph a lot better. But what does it mean at its top level? At a top level, what this diagram shows is that people who go into computer science like to make fancy diagrams. And oh, well, what's the secondary thing we learned from this diagram? It's that we had to create an environment outside of the electronic record. And so we have a near real-time clinical data pipeline. By the way, not many people have implemented this. And why? Well, because I'm a bit of a computer nerd, a computer geek, and I hired people who were, you know, inspirational in their own way, and I gave them the time to create this because in order for us to have an environment where we can create predictive algorithms or we can even use simple rule-based algorithms to change care, we have to have an environment that supports that because if we wait for Epic to develop it, who knows how much hair I'll have left or, uh, or if I'll even still be uh, walking the earth. So I have to make it happen faster, and so we had to create a parallel environment where we could test, where we could implement, where we could model. And so this is an example of something that we're really just about to implement now, which is Muse Plus. Muse is something which has been around for a while. It's like the sepsis alerts, medical early warning system. It's physiologic, it's boring, it works, but once again, very sensitive, but not very specific. Too many false alarms. So what is Muse Plus? The Muse Plus is to taking a what worked out to be, frankly, a random forest model, embedding PI team support, creating clinical work groups, and creating a tool which will hopefully, if it works out to its promise, get the rapid response team to the bedside of people who are deteriorating, whether because of sepsis or because of exacerbation of heart failure or because of something else, let's say their you know, uh, exacerbation of, um, of respiratory failure, and get the frontline providers to the bedside in a way that's more predictive. And the MU score, frankly, is not all that good. If you look at receiver operator characteristic curves, that dotted line that goes from the bottom left to the top right is a coin flip, it's useless. And the MUSE is the green line, which is not that much better, an ROC, receiver operator characteristic curve area of 0.67. Well, in our first iteration, we got the number up to 0.74. Now it's about 0.82. But the point about MUSE Plus is MUSE Plus looks at more than just physiology. It looks at laboratories. It looks at information in the intake that the nurses do at the time of admission. It looks at demographics. Not that hard. And what we're able to do is to use it, and we're now starting to implement that one. But even just very simple things again. This was just a very dumb app that we sent patients home with after acute, really advanced heart failure admissions. And this was done by our app lab. Ashisha Trage is the leader of it. He's a very, very good guy. And this is very simple. It was just a, a scale and a blood pressure cuff. And they were sent home. And 
Every day, uh, they were supposed to get on the scale and get their blood pressure taken, and the app would be connected by Bluetooth and send the information into our team. But of course, part of it was that, of course, the team, if they didn't get data, might call up the patient. And then if the weight went up by three pounds, then maybe we said, hey, what's going on here? You know, did you have a lot of salt? And the patient said, oh, I had potato chips last night. And so what's the response? No potato chips for you. Potato chips are bad for you. And so it created communication. And in this small pilot, this is a tiny pilot, just like 60 patients, our normal readmission rate after advanced heart failure is about 20 to 25%. The admission rate in this group was only 11%. Now, was there selection bias? Did we pick the people who are willing to work with technology? Did we pick people who are more communicative? Yeah, there are a lot of reasons why it might be too optimistic, why there might be a selection bias, but it's the principle, the principle of post-acute engagement and communication. Here's something, though, that actually works and it makes money, a malnutrition predictive engine something that was developed by the same team again of data scientists. And I'm going to skip past this just a little quickly in the interest of time. But we have increased the number of malnutrition diagnoses at Mount Sinai Hospital by about 300, 400%. And why is that important? Three reasons. One, you treat the patient, which is a good thing because they have severe malnutrition. Two, it increases our reimbursement because it's a major comorbid condition and it raises the reimbursement of the DRG within the US. And three, it makes us look much better to external agencies like US News and World Report or Medicare, uh, which we use the term CMS because CMS runs Medicare, because our observed to expected rates of things like length of stay or mortality are adjusted by the comorbid conditions. And so this was an important thing to do, and it really wasn't that hard because what we did was we set up a feedback loop where we were able to get the, the, sorry, the dietitians to give a response and say, okay, in the past, you only had about an 11 or 15% chance of making the diagnosis. Now your chance is about 45% for every patient you're sent to in the morning, and we've uh, actually improved it, and the iteration which is going into uh, implementation in two weeks now has an ROC curve of about 0 0.81. Uh, and this was, uh, RF is the random forest model. And we like random forest a little bit better than neural nets because the nice thing about random forest is it will tell you which particular items in the patient's record resulted in that. And so yeah, this is just the impact uh, in terms of, of reimbursement. So targeted complexity initiatives or clinical documentation improvement is a moneymaker for US hospitals and is something that you should think about if you're developing algorithms. So let me conclude now by talking about things I didn't talk about. I didn't talk very much about population health. We have a group that's working on population health. Um, there's not a lot of data analytics currently in population health, but there can be, and a group that I'm working with will eventually turn their attention there. <coughs> so decision support for the physicians and extenders is where it's at whether it's that pilot I showed you about decreasing readmissions for the advanced heart failure patient or managing our patients in the home with home health extenders, which would not be physicians, they might be nurses, they might even be social workers, sometimes even care coordinators. Precision medicine, which you'll hear later from Joel Dudley, winning at those bundles in value-based episodic care by controlling laboratory imaging, consultation, pharmacy costs by sharing the data and making the physicians partners with the hospital in controlling cost and reducing the negative outcomes of clinical and financial concern by avoiding harm, including infections, using the rapid response teams most effectively, doing hospital at home, using telehealth and moving palliative care upstream, and most importantly in the final line is if you're going to go to the trouble of using an AI approach, make it relevant to value-based care because that's what's gonna be most important at least for the next uh, 10 years, I believe, in the US healthcare system because true population health, full risk is not something which is really on the horizon so much we talk about it a lot, but we don't really implement it in the U.S. health system, but value-based care is here to stay. Thank you for your attention and for the lovely invitation. <laughs>